Hello and welcome to another of our um, hopefully uh, useful information um, events uh, we are, which are directed to parents. Uh, this is part of our um, information week for special education needs for parents. And this is a short pre-recorded uh, seminar on social, emotional and mental health needs of children and young people. Uh, because it does come up quite frequently and we thought a short talk or a short seminar on social, emotional and mental health needs uh, might be helpful to some parents. Obviously, some children and young people who do have social, emotional and mental health needs also have other needs as well. But in many cases, the social, emotional and mental health needs may be one of uh, the major needs or they may be part of a package of needs that that child and young person has, but they should not be forgotten. Um, and a timetable for the rest of the week, obviously, if you're watching this pre-recorded, on Wednesday, we have um, a seminar about ABA. Thursday, um, very important, understanding the annual review process. Friday, section F. Um, and then um, we will also have um, uh, a question and answer session. Uh, all of these videos, it is planned to put on our Facebook page and YouTube so that you can watch them again. And we do hope that you find them useful. So what I'm hoping to cover in this seminar is, can you obtain an EHCP if your child or young person is cognitively able, but does have uh, social, emotional or mental health needs? I can answer that very quickly. And the answer is yes. I will come on to uh, it in more detail later. How to evidence social, emotional, mental health needs. CAMS, what to do if you cannot obtain advice. What does CAMS do, we all wonder. How do social, emotional, mental health needs affect access to learning, adopted children and those who've suffered trauma, the importance of the Section F provision, residential placements for social, emotional, mental health when adoption placements are at risk of breakdown. Um, that's just one of the options. Exploring mainstream schools with support for social, emotional, mental health needs or specialist units. So can you still obtain an education healthcare plan if cognitively able? The answer, as I've already said, is yes, if the social, emotional or mental health needs are preventing a child or young person from accessing education. So it does not matter if that young person has um, anxiety, acute anxiety, meaning that they can't enter, they have difficulty entering school. So some background statistics, um, a large number of the children and young people who we uh, deal with are adopted. Adopted children are much more likely than other children to have experience uh, uh, to have experienced abuse and neglect and the impact of this difficult start in life can lead to special educational needs arising. And I don't think it matters whether the child was adopted at from birth, if I put it that way, or, or soon after birth, few months, one year, two years, three years, five years. Um, the impact of that early life experience uh, can have an effect. That's not to say, of course, um, that social, emotional, or mental health needs arise in all adopted children. Um, we just have, we do see a large number of cases um, which um, where, where, where the young person or child is an adopted child. Adopted children experience higher rates of social, emotional, and behavioral needs with around 38% having clinically significant levels of difficulty. And ac academic attainment is also significantly affected. Data collected by the Department for Education in 2014 shows that at key stage two, only 49% of adopted children reached age-related expectations in reading, writing, and maths, compared with 75% of non-adopted children. 
The Department for Education is increasingly recognising the enduring impact of children's early experiences. It gives an annual grant of £1,900 per adopted child to schools, and it says teachers and schools have a vital role to play in helping adopted children socially, emotionally and educationally. This is called Pupil Premium Plus, and these funds are intended to provide specific support to help raise adopted children's attainment and address their wider needs. There is no specific rule as to how these funds should be adopted should be used by schools. It could be that the schools will, um, that money could be used to provide a mentor for the child or young person or counselling in school or social skills group to be run by a speech and language therapist in school. It depends on the child or young person's needs. Adoptive parents can ask schools to offer support to their child in the following areas. For example, coping with transitions and change. Children who have experienced loss in their early lives can find change anxiety provoking and it can trigger reactions. Schools can prepare children by talking them through what will happen, building calming activities and mindfulness into transition points in the school day, ensuring that they provide a goodbye when children or staff leave the school and letting parents know of any unexpected changes such as supply staff covering absences. Schools hopefully should be aware of what are the trigger events. In some cases, um, having an extra member of staff or somebody specifically employed to greet that child or young person as they uh, enter the school gates and having a morning routine with that child and young person, bringing in them into the classroom, perhaps ahead of the others, not having to line up in the playground with the others because they find that a bit overwhelming, getting them to settle into the classroom before the others. All of that can help with transition and change. Managing anxiety, shame and other difficult feelings. Children who've been abused and neglected can experience difficult feelings which can result in challenging behaviours. Schools can provide nurture groups or nurture breakfast clubs to help children settle at the start of the day, help children to calm down as we would help young children, using soothing strategies, provide structure during unstructured times such as playtimes and the end of term, and use empathetic behaviour management strategies such as gently acknowledging the child's feelings. It all very much depends on the child or young person's uh, difficulties and anxieties. If that child um, has acute anxiety uh, being out in the playground at lunchtime, then it then then the schools um, should be able to adopt um, a, 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 an alternative for that child or young person. And that may be um, having a TA or LSA specifically for that period of time. Can be that that TA might go into the playground and help the child or young person to, um, to, to play games with other children or, and, and to develop social skills. Developing trusting relationships with adults. Children who have learned that adults are unpredictable, unavailable or harmful may find it difficult to form secure trusting relationships. Schools can provide a key adult who will be available and predictable and a mentor for the child, provide relationship play with children might have, might have missed out on, use transitional objects to help the child hold on to the adoptive parent and the key adult in school, and make efforts to reconnect and repair relationships with the child when things go wrong. All of these are um, strategies which can be employed uh, by a school. Developing social skills and peer relationships. Children may be preoccupied with ensuring their needs are met by adults or may not yet have the skills they need for successful interactions with other children. Schools can provide opportunities to develop play skills. I've already mentioned having perhaps a TA whose particular role or job is to uh, be in the playground at lunchtime and be around to uh, help 
uh, that young person develop play skills with other children can provide social skills groups which explicitly teach social skills. Um, social skills group, you need more than just your child or young person. You need a few others. Um, you don't necessarily need big group, but I would have said three to five um, uh, uh, could, be success, could be a good size uh, of children or young people with similar difficulties. You need someone, either a speech and language therapist or a TA who's been trained by the speech and language therapist to set up these social skills groups and run the social skills groups, uh, which will be a benefit to your child or young person as well as the others in the group. So set up small structural interactions where children can practice key skills such as taking turns. Again, this is something a school can do. Developing children's executive functioning skills. Children who have relied on their survival brains may need additional opportunities to develop their thinking brains. Schools can provide coaching to develop planning and organisational skills. Offer scaffolding by breaking ta tasks down into steps and teaching children to use checklists. And provide a narrative of everyday activities, such as getting changed for swimming or ensuring that children have their homework in their bags. Children often um, uh, who have emotional um, difficulties can have um, very significant organisational difficulties because they're anxious a lot of the time. Uh, and so they need prompting and reminding and checklists of what they have to do. Some schools use the personal education plan process which is statutory for looked after children but not for adopted children to identify, plan for and review children's support needs. Because as the child or young person gets older, their needs are likely to change and therefore the provision to meet those needs is likely to change. What can I as a parent do? Make sure that you are sharing the information for the school to make sense of the child's difficulties and being clear about the purpose of sharing. Make contact with the key support staff, SENCO or pastoral lead to establish a partnership when the child joins the school rather than waiting until things go wrong. This can be very difficult if your child or young person is in secondary school. Secondary schools are often large uh, institutions. Some of them can be one, two thousand or more. And it can be difficult to know who the right person is to speak to. Your child or young person can have 10 or more different teachers for different lessons. In primary school, it is much easier because the child or young person will generally have one form teacher and they get to know your child very well and understand the difficulties. Have a dialogue with the school about how the pupil premium plus is to be spent. Working with the school to identify potential curriculum hotspots such as family trees or teaching about genetics and working with the school to identify modifications which will include the adopted child. Identify and linking up with other adoptive and special guardianship families at the school. Can also uh, provide support to parents. Contact your local authority adoption service if you need support. Um, for your child's special educational needs. What does this mean for EHC plans? The process of requesting an EHC plan remains the same and so does the statutory time frame. The local authority should pay particular attention to evidence of the child's physical, emotional and social development and health needs, drawing on relevant evidence from clinicians and other health professionals and what has been done to meet these by other agencies. If you, you if a, as a parent, you request an EHCP assessment or you have an EHCP, you need to make sure that all of uh, the uh, child's difficulties and needs are in section B, and then you need to, uh, um, make sure that there is some provision to meet those needs in section F. In many cases where a child has, may have cognitive difficulties as well, or other sensory difficulties, a local authority will concentrate on those parts 
of the EHCP, and we'll concentrate on those parts of sec. We'll concentrate on those parts of section F. It is important that any EHC plan where a child or young person has social, emotional, and mental health needs that there is provision in section F. Quite often, local authorities simply leave social, emotional, and mental health provisional needs in section F blank because they feel that they've already making provision for cognitive, they're all may be making provision for sensory needs. Parents should remember that social, emotional, mental health provisions are just as important as other educational provisions. So what experts should you, what expert reports should you request? The local authority should seek advice and information from any person the child's parent or young person reasonably requests. Now you can request psychotherapists, clinical psychologists, reports from trauma agencies, CAMs, social care. Note that adoptions funds can fund in, um, independent um, uh, professional reports. If there has been any independent clinical psychologists or psychotherapists um, uh, involved with your child, uh, then uh, it may be that you need up-to-date reports from them so that you can include what provision they recommend in the EHCP. CAMS, whichever local authority you are in England or Wales, do seem to be particularly um, <sighs> reluctant to provide any meaningful or useful reports. Um, if CAMS refuse to um, assess your child and provide a report as part of uh, the EHC process, then you can consider judicial review proceedings, but it is really hard. I recognize it is very hard for parents uh, with uh, when CAMS frequently, um, even with a child, who clearly has significant social, emotional, mental health needs, saying that the waiting list is two and a half years, or the report says, uh, acknowledges the difficulties, but doesn't suggest any provision. <coughs> At times, adoptive placements can break down because of the social, emotional, and mental health needs. One, rather than the adoptive placement breakdown, you can. Uh, consider a specialist social, emotional, mental health, uh, or a, a school that specialises in, in social, emotional, and mental health needs. This then can maintain the, uh, can help uh, uh, maintain the adoption uh, placement, but also provide much more intensive therapeutic support for the child or young person. So schools which specialise in social, emotional and mental health um, are often independent special schools. You will need to um, have a look on, on the internet to find a school near you. Some of the schools are residential. Um, some of them are can be day boarders. A lot of them are residential because uh, the view is that where children or young people have significant social, emotional and mental health needs, they require um, a fairly intensive therapeutic environment, um, which, uh, and they need that therapeutic environment to continue past three o'clock when schools finish. Um, therefore, um, a number of them are uh, residential. Just because a school is a special independent school and it, just because it's residential does not mean that um, a local authority cannot name that school in section I of the EHCP and therefore be responsible for costs. If you do visit a school that, that specializes in social, emotional, or mental health needs, ask questions about the use of nurture, knowledge about trauma and attachment, mental health first aid and positive behavior support. Staff at the school, um, 
usually are very passionate about issues around child and adolescent mental health and well-being, um, and that's likely to come over. And often those, the, the schools have very experienced staff. The school will often have a creative and flexible curriculum. The school will be um, uh, organised in such a way to try and ensure that a, a young child or young person's social, emotional and mental health needs are, uh, that, that it, they do receive support for those needs so that the young person and child can access education. Specialist schools will often have um, extracurricular activities, which will also and should help the young person uh, with social, emotional and mental health needs. Um, thank you uh, for watching uh, this seminar on children with social, emotional and mental health needs. Um, we also covered um, some problems which were specific uh, to children um, who are adopted. Um, that is not to say that uh, children who are adopted ha always have social, emotional and mental health needs, but it is, um, uh, it, it is quite common and therefore I've dealt with um, a, a adoption as well. Um, this has been a, a very small uh, seminar on a particular point. Um, many children and young people who have social, emotional and mental health needs also have other difficulties, other needs, and need provision to meet those other needs as well. Um, thank you very much for watching.